Another one. <laughs> um, now the scripture reading from Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them, to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Wait, wait, and, oh yeah, for the God, people of God, I don't know, um, and now, the man, the myth, the legend, Aaron Beltran! <laughs> Hey, Ann, where'd you put the mic? I kind of got scared. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, uh, blue mic, uh, am I on? Hello? Oh, is it on? Okay, cool, just making sure. So if you wouldn't mind bowing your head for a moment of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I just pray that today you just let uh, your f truths and uh, your facts just flow from my mouth, God. So I just pray that, um, you know, as this is my last Sunday, that you just let me contain my emotions to get your word out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you haven't met me, <laughs> it's a little late. <laughs> So if you haven't met me, my name is Aaron Beltran. I'm the Associate Pastor of Youth and Outreach at this church, and I've been doing so for going on three years. And so I am thankful and ever will be thankful for my opportunities that I've had here to serve, not just in this church, but in this community. And uh, I would like to say thank you to Colt. Uh, big impact. He was like, hey, you should coach. And I was like, no, I'm, I didn't have good coaching experiences growing up. And I was like, no, that's not for me. And he's like, no, you're going to coach. So, <laughs> so once again, I was able to serve in a community of here that we call Riedoso. So um, I'm just so thankful for, uh, as our um, call to worship said, that when you invite a family, it turns into a community. So I, I just want to say thank you for that. So getting into this sermon today, uh, obviously I'm leaving. <laughs> this is my last Sunday. So I wanted to leave with, at you know, just a message, uh, something that I've learned since being here, and I wanted you to learn it. That way you can take it and run with it once I leave. And I hope and pray that y'all continue sending me text saying how y'all are going to be taking this message into the community and hopefully maybe even past our community. And so when I first became a Christian, I kind of shared some of my testimonies with that. I think a couple of times I've been up here. I never really talk about the after. And so when I first became a Christian, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't really even open a Bible. And so me and my buddy that had accepted Christ that night, we were walking back to our dorm and we decided to go eat because that's what college kids do is, you know, hey, it's 1230 in the morning. Let's go eat. So we go to Taco Bell. And as we're heading back from Taco Bell, we get stuck at this red light. And this light just will not go green. And so six minutes goes by, and we're still sitting there. And we're like, all right, we're Christian now. We can't be, you know, not following laws. <laughs> and so I get out, and I start dancing in front of the car, and then finally it changes. So we start going. And the guy I had accepted Christ with, I look over at him. I'm like, hey, man, uh, he, I was like, you were a Christian before, right? He goes, yeah, back when I was a kid. And so I was like, so what are you going to do? And he just looks at me and he's like, okay, I think I'm going to go, I, I want to read through John again. And I just, cool, but I don't know what that means, but that's awesome. <laughs> and so he's like, wait, you've never opened a Bible? And I was like, no, I think I'm going to start with Genesis. And he was like, I don't know, man, that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> and I was like, no, dude, like, you can't just skip in the story. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, you know, that's like, you know, going and watching the first Star Wars. Oh, wait, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Anyways, so I go, I get my Bible that was just given to me, and I immediately go to the Hellcat at one in the morning, and I just start reading. And so that started a tradition for the next two months to where every night that I got an opportunity, I would go to our, our computer lab. That was a 24-7 access computer lab, and I would walk in, and I would sit down, and I would just hunker down and start reading in the Bible. So once again, 
I started with Genesis, and personally, I loved it. <laughs> and so uh, I started, you know, joining Bible studies. I continued to walk in my faith. And it was one of those like, hey, you're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be doing this too. So then I kept adding stuff. So once again, I wasn't in a Bible study. And one of the guys that was there the night I accepted Christ was like, hey, where have you been? And I was like, oh, I've just been in the Hulk reading the Bible. And he's like, oh, cool. So like, have you joined a Bible study yet? And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and he's like, oh, dude, you should join our Bible study. So obviously one at a time I started implementing these things to, quote, quote, continue my Christianity. And kind of reminds me of what was going on with the disciples because I also expressed this story a couple of Sundays uh, a while back that I started joining these Bible studies and I was sitting in church and I was just worshiping. And I was just worshiping passionately. And this lady next to me, uh, I don't really know age that well. I'm not really good at judging, nor do I want to say it out loud. So I was sitting next to this lady and she looks over at me and she was just like, uh, you're a new Christian, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Why? And she goes, well, because I you are so happy, I can tell. And then that kind of like affected me. I was like, wait, are not all Christians like this? And it really, really messed with me. And I was like, no, like, no, I am going to be like this for the rest of my life. And kind of reminds me of the Bible. So last Sunday, obviously, Resurrection Sunday. And so we're all happy that Jesus returned and we should be. You know, he died for our sins and he re resurrected. Because if there was no resurrection, there is no story to tell. This is just a hollow church, if that's the case. But he returned, and obviously, we should be glad that he did. The piece of information that I've never really looked at was what was the disciples doing between the resurrection and the last time they see him? And so I started reading. And I didn't realize, because no one ever really points it out, Jesus' ministry, once he returns from the cross, extended for 40 days. And during those 40 days, he is seen 10 different times. So I will say this out loud. If you want to write notes, that's awesome. You can, we have a YouTube channel that needs more views, so please go back and look at these for notes. But the first appearance that we mostly all know is with Mary Magdalene, right? And then, so that one's in John 20, 11 through 18. It's in Mark 16, 9 through 10. And Matthew 28, 9 through 10. And then, so once again, we see all these different stories between the first time we see him all the way to the last time that we see the disciples. And once again, it affected me when that lady said, oh, you must be a new Christian. And then I started looking at what happened to the disciples. So when, before they see Jesus for the last time, they're sitting in a room. And I found an article that kind of pointed out exactly the viewpoint of what the disciples were going through. So if you wouldn't mind just listening for a second. So the following article put into perspective what was going on in, the li in their lives and in their eyes. They were in a sheltered place doing the safest thing they could do, staying home. The whole world had been turned upside down in a matter of days. As they knew it forever changed, and well, what seemed like an unshakable, uh, unshakable was certainly or suddenly uncertain. Recent events were hard to believe and even harder to watch. News of death was overwhelming and their lives were at risk. Confused and afraid, they sought refuge in the place that they felt safe, a warm and welcoming home. At home, they were protected from the chaos swirling on the other side of the door. And I started thinking, man, that sounds so familiar. <laughs> and in my 10 years of my, or going on 12 years of my faith, uh, I've seen that so many times. And I wish I've only seen it in other people, but unfortunately, it's happened to me. And so after I became a Christian, uh, I started, you know, going down that backward trajectory road that often happens with people that just accept faith or accept faith in a quick manner and not understanding the full 
you know, concept of the triune God. And I often think that's potentially what happened to the disciples is because they knew Jesus and they knew the Father, but they didn't really know the Holy Spirit yet. And so in my own story, I was telling my kids a couple weeks ago about keeping your heart in check. And I said, sometimes your heart, if you're not checking it constantly, it, it starts to, you know, push you aside and you're not realizing it because sometimes you get on bad paths with good intentions. Has anyone else done this or is this just me? <laughs> and so in college, well, once again, I told you, I was going to the Helk, that's our computer lab, every night to study the Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. However, when you're only studying the Bible and you're in college, something's wrong. And so my grades started to tank. And as an incoming freshman, my grades weren't good to begin with. And so I realized how bad my high school was once getting to college. And I'm not trying to use that too much of an excuse, so don't use that as an excuse. But truly, I mean, it was, it was rough. And uh, I was way behind. I mean, it was just setback after setback. And I was in college algebra, so pre-algebra first, because once again, I had to go back and take some courses over. So I took pre-algebra. And I was like, oh, man, this is cake. So first semester, I didn't even study. I just went in, got it done. And uh, I passed with a, like a B plus. And for me, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I didn't even study. Well, college algebra starts and oh my goodness. So I had this teacher, I'm pretty sure she was German and her accent was very evident. And on top of that, I'm pretty sure she had ADHD. So she couldn't teach with just one dry erase board. She had five. And so she would start on one board and then jump over to a different board. And then before even finishing that equation, and then before you could write down that equation, she was already sliding the board down to get next to the next board. And so she was two on this side, three on this side. So she was just sliding and changing and she was just going way too fast for me because I'm very, you know, just slow and tedious with how I do stuff. Like I'm very regimented and uh, she was not. <laughs> and so I went up to her after school and I was like, hey, like I'm really struggling. Like I, I, my learning style doesn't really fit with your teaching style. And not, not trying to be rude or anything. And she's like, well, no one else asks questions. Why aren't you, like, why aren't you getting it? And I'm like, I'm the only non-athletic kid in this, in this, in this program, so they all have tutors. <laughs> and so she's just like, well, maybe you should get a tutor. That's what I did. And so I went out to our tutoring uh, lab access to, to apply for a tutor. And there was a girl there that was like, hey, I can tutor you. Kind of knew her. She was an upperclassman and... Very good intentions. Let's get math tutoring. And so our help, like I said, was 24-7. So we went over there after my classes every day, and she would help tutor me. And once again, good intentions. Real bad later. <laughs> and one day, I'm getting tutoring, and then a winter storm is blowing in. And I'm like, I have a final tomorrow. Our president at the time was from Alaska, he didn't believe in canceling classes, so I knew regardless, I was having this exam tomorrow. So I go to get tutoring, and she's like, hey, weather's getting bad at the Hulk. You live at Jarrett Hall, right? So my, camp, my dorm was right here, and right across the street was called Buff, and that's where her dorm was. And so she's like, I have a community uh, room, so the way that theirs worked was a little bit different from mine. Mine was you know, just a room, and then you had a centralized bathroom, and that was it. Theirs was apartment-style living, so apartment in the middle, and then the rooms were on the outside of the apartments. that makes sense? Hopefully everyone gets it. <laughs> and so we go there, so we're sitting in the common area, and it went from, oh, let's study, to, hey, let's watch a movie, to, hey, let's do this, hey, let's do this. And so I'm in the middle of, you know, trying to hook certain things, if you know what I mean, and my phone starts ringing. And she looks down, she knows the name on my phone, it was my RA, and so she knew who he was because he went to the same, uh, you know, uh, my mind just went blank, religious organization that we, I went to. And so she looks, she's like, hey, you're going to get that. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. Anyways, where were we? <laughs> and so I go over, and I start doing things again, and all of a sudden my phone goes off again. And I, I look down, and she's like, are you going to get that? I'm like, no, like, it's fine. It's whatever. Stop. <laughs> so I pinch it off. And all of a sudden, rings again. And she's like, no, you really, really need to get that at this time. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. And so I open my phone, and uh, I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? 
And I've previously talked about this gentleman. His name is Scott Cooper. And so if you know my testimony, he's the one that brought me to this place that I accepted Christ. So, and he's also my RA at this point. And he's like, he has like this real deep voice. If you met him, you would know his voice. But he's like, brother man. That's how deep his voice is. I can't do it too much. But that's his voice. He's a brother man, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, I'm just hanging out with uh, Kristen and I'm, I'm getting this studying done. And immediately, like, I just felt like this hole in my stomach. Like, you know, that first time you do something that you know you shouldn't be doing and you try to push through it, I got that hole in my chest. And he's like, oh, okay, what time is it? He's asking one of those loaded questions. And I was like, oh, man, yeah, dude, it's 2 in the morning. <laughs> and he's like, all right, brother, man, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. And I was like, oh. So I hung up the phone. And I was just kind of sitting there. I was like, dude, my stomach hurts now. Like, I'm not even, my mind's not even here. And then she just looks at me, and she has this, like, real mean appearance in her face. I'm like, you okay? What's my name? God took it from my mouth. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> She's like, how about you grab your stuff and go? Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> And so I'm all the way to the dorm, and it was, it was by far the coldest, most unelegant walk of shame I've ever potentially seen in somebody else, let alone myself. And I get back to the dorm, and my roommate's there, and he's like, so what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, like, I, I think I messed up, dude. Like, and started thinking about, like, what happened? How did I get here? And it was definitely one of those walks of paths that starts off with good intentions, but without boundaries or anything, like stuff like that happens. And that's why I tell my kids, watch your heart, guard your heart. Make sure you're doing daily checks on what you're doing because it, ta it takes nothing but a second for you to go over here. And so I'm just sitting there. I'm like, oh, man, like I'm obviously upset. <laughs> I grew up with a single mom, and I just know how disrespectful I was. And yet I, I know God did that on purpose because <laughs> he wanted me out of that situation. And so... Looking at my story, I can see how the disciples got to where they were at. It's, it's quick. It's, you know, their lives got turned way upside down. They went from, you are the Messiah, even though God, the entire Jesus, the entire time was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Hey, last supper, I'm going to die. And, you know, obviously, you don't want anyone to die. It doesn't matter how many times they tell you, hey, I'm going to die. You don't want that in somebody. And so I can see how you create this wall of, you know, blocking out something like that. And so, obviously, we're getting to a point to where we look at the disciples after the Holy Spirit filled their lives, when they finally understood what the true triune God meant. It wasn't just the Jesus that they knew. It wasn't just the God of the stories that they heard. We also added in the Holy Spirit. They went from being no offense, but these cowards that are hiding in their home, you know, waiting for death to these men that go into the world and they change lives after lives. And they didn't have easy, easy lives. I mean, just look at Peter crucified on a cross upside down. He didn't feel like he was worthy to be crucified normally because he wasn't that of Jesus. Peter, or uh, sorry, that was Peter. James. King Herod, or Herod had him killed by the sword in Jerusalem. Andrew, was later traveled, who was traveling through modern Turkey and Greece, was then martyred. And much of the other disciples, other than John, experienced the exact same scenario, where they were martyred for their faith. And so you take someone that doesn't understand the triune God, they only understand one or two aspects of God, who God truly is, they turn from their faith as soon as it gets hard. And God never said it's going to be easy. Matter of fact, whenever he sees the disciples hiding, before he gives them the Holy Spirit, he actually rebukes them for their fear. Because the entire time, he's like, don't fear. Like, pit that fear on me. I can carry that fear. And we also see it in normal stories of people because, obviously, I like stories. So I'm going to tell you another story. And so in 1956... Some of y'all might know this date. Some of y'all might not. I don't know. I don't know y'all's lives. <laughs> but in 
there was an operation, our mission, missional operation called Operation Aka. I could be pronouncing that wrong, but A-U-C-A. And it consisted of five missionaries, four of which were the actual missionaries, and one of them was the pilot. And they would later be known as the Ecuadorian Five. So they wanted to go to Ecuador to bring the light of Christ into this, uh, this savage people. So if you look at their name, it's Horani. I can't, you know, once again, I could be pronouncing that wrong. But in the native language that surrounded this tribe, it meant literally savage people. And so at this point, any type of Christian mercenary that had tried to enter this were completely ignored or chased off of. And so the Ecuadorian five, they had started learning their language. They started doing helicopter or plane rides around, yelling out from a loud speaker, uh, loudspeaker saying, hey, we love you. We come in peace. We love you. They just kept repeating this for weeks on weeks. And the entire time that they were doing this, they're dropping care package after care package. And it consisted of clothes, miscellaneous foods. It was really weird. It was like monkey tails. I mean, I guess over there that means something good. And so they're just dropping all these care packages to these people. And so they finally say, hey, we're going to start making our way into this tribe. So they find this little grass strip where the plane can land. And they built this like makeshift tree, tree house. And uh, once again, they keep on the loudspeaker every now and then. They'll get in the plane, survey their, what's going on around them. And amongst this, uh, so on... I want to say it was January 3rd. Let me look. January 3rd. Uh, they finally run into three members of this tribe, which consisted of two females and one male. And they come out of the forest mysteriously. Very, I would say it would be scary, but they come out of this, this villa, the jungle. And they're kind of cautious at first. And they approach the missionaries. And one of the missionaries who has a journal uh, says, I grabbed him by the hand and I took him into our camp to show him the love of God. And so he takes him around the camp and teaches, and then he was really in awe of the plane because he had been seeing it fly around. So the pilot loads him in the plane and they said he screamed the entire plane ride. <laughs> and they get down from the plane and he's just like in awe of everything. And they, they're kind of backing away and they're trying to talk to them like, hey, can we come with you? And the, the young man was kind of like, no. And the way that they presented it was like, I don't have the authority to bring you into our tribe. So they quickly recede into the tree line. And one of the missionaries in his journal wrote, the door was open, but I feel like I did not take enough action to get through this door. And I can, quickly seeing, I can quickly see this door closing. And three days later, he writes in his journal, after radioing in saying, hey, we think we found the tribe by the creek. We're going to go investigate. We'll be back at 4.45 p.m. And this was at 2.15. There was no radio transmission that came in later that day. Five days later, a uh, search party was obviously done to find these missionaries. All five were found, and unfortunately, they were speared to death. And uh, they know the exact time it happened. It was 2.35, because the missionary's watch was frozen from whenever he got hit in the attack. And so I tell you the story not to be like, you should be scared. <laughs> But I'm telling you this story because Jesus tells us to go make disciples of the nations, right? We personally believe that because I see it every Sunday. It says it right there. Go make disciples. And so, as I said earlier, there's a couple of things I've learned since I've been here. And coming here was a very scary experience. Me and Emily, we just had Theo. We wrapped up our stuff. I was working on the railroad, not feeling certain about the future. And God's like, hey... Call Mikey. Mikey got in touch with you guys. That's what got us here. And every second of the way, we were worried. Like, we didn't know anybody here. We didn't, you know, we've only come up here as kids. And we didn't obviously know any of these kids down here. 
it's different whenever a youth kid potentially says, hey, my church is doing this, and you get invited. That's awesome. But in saying that, there's certain situations that happen where Jesus goes and tells you to go do something. And in, in the scripture, it's very obvious what he wants you to go do. Go make disciples of the nation. And so for some of you, your mind might go, well, I don't know if I want to go to India. I don't know if I want to go to Asia. I don't know if I want to go here. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying all of you go do that. Because if all of you went to do that, what would happen to the United States? Wouldn't be good, right? So what you can be doing, and this is also for my kids, because y'all are in high school, going and making disciples of the nation could be you preaching at your high school. It could be you talking to friends at high school. And then for some of you, you live next to country clubs. Go make disciples in the country clubs. Some of you live in the downs. Go to the downs and make disciples in the downs. And so... Because once again, I told you, we didn't come here with anybody. We didn't know anybody. We didn't know any of you. But Jesus, by telling us, go make disciples of the nations, we came here into this community. And I would say, leaving, y'all are my family. I would feel comfortable if any of y'all called me or I would call you to check on on you. You know, like, hey, Priscilla, how are you doing? Still doing the dog walking? How's it going? You know, hey, Ed, how's it going? You know, Leroy, how are you doing at the food bank? You know, there's some of y'all, I wouldn't mind calling, not some, all of y'all, I don't mind calling (laughs) y'all. And I don't mind if you text me, call me, whatever. And this goes for the youth kids. Just because we're not here doesn't mean we're gone. Like, we will come up here for graduations, marriages, whatever. That goes to y'all back there. (laughs) Congratulations. Anyways, so I just want to let y'all know that we love you guys, and we're happy that God sent us here into this community to be with you guys. Thank you. So 